your complete collection of six or 10 or 106 first line managers is the number one asset in the organization. As somebody said with research evidence behind them, people don't leave companies, they leave their boss. Hi, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. I'm your host, Isolde Trachtenberg. On the show, you get my conversations with peak performing thought leaders, creatives, and entrepreneurs. Every week, I bring you the latest scoop on what these incredible people do to succeed and how you can get their secrets and do it too. If you're enjoying the show, I'd be super grateful if you support the show on Patreon. You get some exclusive and fun bonuses. Go to patreon.com slash innovative mindset and join in. And now, let's get on with the show. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I'm your host, and I'm thrilled that you're here. I'm also incredibly honored and thrilled that Tom Peters is joining me on the show. Tom Peters is co-author of In Search of Excellence, the book that changed the way the world does business and often is tagged as the best business book ever ever. Many books and 35 years later, Tom is still at the forefront of the management guru industry he single-handedly invented. What's new? A lot. As CNN said, while most business gurus milk the same mantra for all it's worth, the one-man brand called Tom Peters is still reinventing himself. His previous book, The Excellence Dividend, Meeting the Tech Tide with Work That Wows and Jobs That Last, is amazing. Tom's bedrock belief is execution is strategy. It's all about the people and the doing, not the talking and the theory. In November 2017, Tom received the Thinker's 50 Lifetime Achievement Award. And this week, in fact, today, he's releasing his latest and last book and course called Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. Hey there, and welcome to the Innovative Mindset Podcast. My name is Isolde Trachtenberg. I am thrilled that you're here, and I'm also so honored and thrilled to welcome today's guest, Tom. Thank you so much for being here. It's so great to have you back on the show. The ple- the pleasure is all mine, even though I'm doing it with a mask on. Far from <laughs> humanity. <laughs> I'm so, it's, a, it, it's really wonderful. It, it's also wonderful that we got a chance to chat a little bit before we started recording the show. And there's so much to talk about, but I'm, I'm thrilled and excited to get the new book when it comes out. I wanted to ask you the new book, Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. I love the title. What prompted you to write it now? And what is extreme humanism? What does well, that mean to you? Two things like everything in life there's before and after the pandemic Mm. Uh, before the pandemic i really became fixated on these studies there was one that was famous that came out of oxford university that said and it was it was an america it was based on america or whatever whatever it was it said 50 percent of american white collar jobs were susceptible to replacement by artificial intelligence within 20 years. Hmm. And the part that goes beyond that, and it was just a big piece, I think, in the New York Times, maybe this weekend in the review section, is we ain't going after factory jobs anymore. We're going after lawyers, <laughs> and doctors, and so-called professionals. I had this wonderful experience with the, with the legal thing. Years and years ago, I gave a talk to the management section of the American Bar Association. And so we're having a coffee break in the middle. And I am talking to this wonderful woman who happened to be uh, a member of the Supreme Court of the great state of Oklahoma. And, you know, she said to me at one charming point in the conversation, do you know what your problem is? And (laughs) I looked at her and I said, no, Justice, I'm not sure what my problem is. And she said, you spent too much time looking at the O.J. Simpson trial. She said, 95% of law is mechanical and boring. Hmm. There are those big, you know, Bill Gates versus the world and so on and so on uh, deals, but they are 2% of the whole. So assuming you didn't graduate from the Harvard Law School, uh, if you're just a mortal, uh, you're at risk. 
And so that was what was really on my mind. And, uh, and the extreme humanism idea is I have, and it's not just a matter of my advanced age, I have no idea relative to AI what's going on, what will be going on 20 years from now. But there is one thing I do know as a high powered mathematician to get to 20 years from now, the first thing you've got to do is get through today. And the onset of total wipeout by AI is not going to happen in the next five or 10 years. But the extreme humanism idea is that I believe, and I've been saying this for 43 years, I believe that if you really, truly, no kidding, in your organization of two or a thousand and two people, put people first, you can create at least for the next 10 or 15 years, incredible products that you are proud to brag about to your spouse, your kids, your aunt, your uncle, your grandmother, uh, and develop people who are completely committed to learning and growing and so on. And that's going to get us through the next, but it's, it's the human side. Uh, you know, I keep quoting the former Apple design chief, Johnny Ive, relative to products and services. And he said, this may sound arrogant, but we really want to try to design products that will make the world just a teeny bit better. And my strong bias on that one is that you can do that as the owner of a local two-person utility repair company as you can if you're in the middle of some you know, big behemoth. Uh, so it's how to humanize things. There's also the part that I do not pretend to understand, but there's the AI versus IA thing. AI is artificial intelligence and IA is usually intelligence augmented. So to what extent do we use this tool to get rid of your job? And to what extent do we use this tool to make your job even broader and of higher quality than it was before? So you know, I think I think the, I think the human side of stuff can uh, serve us well, and and then the you know then the real point of that is that's what I said, and that's what I was writing about, and that's what my first draft was about, and then oh my God, along comes the pandemic, hmm. uh, and these ideas suddenly, at least in my opinion, are ten times more powerful than they ever were before. Now. I promise you, I am not going to read you the entire 287 page book. But what I will tell you is that I'm going to read the second page. And this came, you, you've met my great colleague, Shelly Dolly. And when all the pandemic stuff started and I was sitting on my bum at home and my wife, who was a tapestry artist, was working on making masks i thought you know excuse my language i don't know what language you're you're you know what's your language watch but but uh you know i wasn't going to sit on my ass for the next 12 months that's what it <laughs> boiled down to and so you know we said let's talk about leadership in the time of COVID. and so i developed this is not genius what i called which is on page two of the new book the leadership seven COVID-19 and the leadership seven are be kind, be caring, be patient, be forgiving, be positive, be present, walk in the other person's shoes. Uh, I think that's the way we need especially to behave right now. But the dirty little secret is it always works. You know, it always works. So that's a hell of a long winded question answer to your question. Not at all. And in fact, I love that you said that it always works because those are those are principles and ideals that I think if we all strive for them, 
wow, so much more would happen, so much more connection, so much more communication, so much more listening would be amazing. There's well, something... let, me, let me just add to one thing because it makes that point. One of the things I quote is, and you're a greater New Yorker, if you were a Brooklynite, mm -hmm. uh, is from David Brooks in the New York Times op-ed. Mm -hmm. And he, oh God, I love this so much. He contrasted resume virtues versus eulogy virtues. Mm. Resume virtues, obviously, I graduated from Humpty Humpty Hump School. I went to work for this great company. I was promoted seven times in the first 10 years, et cetera, et cetera. Eulogy virtues are just what they say. What are they going to say about you at your funeral? And he makes the obvious point that they are going to talk about what kind of a human being was she, how did she deal with other people, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and to some extent, my book could be one page long and it would just quote David Brooks. <laughs> you know, how did you do today on your eulogy virtues? And again, the damn thing which I say, and you know, this is a practical and kind of business oriented group that, we, that we're talking to being watched by, et cetera. It's the best way to make money. It's the best way to make money. It's the best way to have happy customers. It's the best way to create products that are absolutely fabulous beyond belief. Uh, and, and that's the part that, you know, continues to piss me off. This stuff isn't about how can you and I be better human beings and be real sweethearts? It's how can you and I be better human beings and being sweethearts and care for our fellow human beings and make money along the way? I mean, what can I say? I've said the same. I just wrote a tweet the other day. And I said, I really hope you buy my new book because I really busted my butt writing it. But I do want to tell you ahead of time that I've said the same thing in my last 18 books. Uh, you know, people <laughs> first, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm just saying it one more time. And this is my planned last book. And so this is my last gasp of saying, for God's sakes, put people first. It works. I so love that you said that because it would be lovely. I, I've worked for two bosses who had that that's that idea and they were amazing, but the rest have been too worried about their own butts. So how yep. do we get past that? Because the reality is many managers and leaders are afraid of looking bad or of being surpassed by the very people who are on their teams. So what, what are your thoughts about how we get past that, that, oh, what if my people are better than I am feeling? Uh, uh, I'm turning off my audio now because that's too hard a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, uh, I know what I want to tell you if you've just left your big company and you're starting your two-person business. I know what I want to tell you. Well, yeah. Ah. Uh, First of all, there are 500 human beings on earth who, in whom I have absolutely no interest. And they are the 500 CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies. Hmm. Uh, what I'm interested in is the young woman or young man, age 27, who is a project manager with six people reporting to her on a project that will last between 60 and 180 days. And she's the one, he's the one, he needs it more than she does on these dimensions, but that's another thing we'll talk about. Uh, she's the one who can start her management career by just beating her, looking in the mirror every morning, beating herself over the head and saying, you know, I'm going to come to work I mean, my, my bias about leadership, I call it the ultimate human opportunity. Uh, just walk in today and look at those eight people and think to yourself, how could I help them be a little bit better by the end of the day than they were this morning? And if that's your bias, you will find out that you have got eight people who basically will do your your bidding. Uh, but as to 
what to do. I don't know what the hell to tell the 47 year old male manager who is a son of a bitch and is, as you say, scared of people who might be better than he is or as good as you. I don't know what the hell to say to that 47 year old. And so I'm going to forget about him, him mainly. And I'm going to work on this new generation of 26 year olds or 19 year olds or 32 year olds or 35 year olds who have the world ahead of them and say, Hey, you know, you're going to feel better about yourself. You're going to be feel better about being around your kids. Uh, you're going to feel better X number of years from now when you get up to the pearly gates and St. Peter Max's decision as to whether you go up or down. Um, <laughs> And so, no, I, I my point about here, this is not the answer. This is me, once again, sneaking away from your question. <laughs> there was a tweet somewhere that said, you know, Elon Musk is probably one of the two greatest people on earth. And my response was, I said, I have an exceptional degree of respect for Mr. Musk. I respect him almost as much as I respect that committed third grade elementary school teacher who changes the lives of 20 kids and has done it for the last 17 years. She's my hero, number one. And, you know, I that was not a Twitter line. It's 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 really, really true. I, I, uh, I went to a private school. I'm talking to you from Massachusetts, but it wasn't one of those private schools. <laughs> it was a private school in Annapolis, Maryland. It was no big deal, but it's closest to home. But at any rate, um, it did have a tuition and my parents couldn't afford it. And so my mother, I mean, this is like, you know, 1955. So being a stay at home mom was not exactly unusual. So my mother had to go to school, had to, you know, had to become a teacher. And she taught the fifth grade. And so skip ahead to 2005 and my dearly beloved mother passes away and we have a memorial service. And needless to say, Tom Peters, the great public speaker, gave just the most amazing little talk you've ever heard in your life, as did a couple of other people. When this thing was over, I was physically attacked by 45-year-old former fifth grade students of my mother hmm. saying how that one year of their lives with her made the biggest difference of any single thing that had happened to them. I mean, I was just, you know, whatever is beyond tears is, is, is what I was. And so, you know, I'll take my mom over the average fortune 500 CEO any day. Well, you're absolutely, you're singing my song, Tom, because I, I, teachers are my heroes and I work in schools. I go into schools and teach kids leadership skills. And we talk a lot, the teachers and I, about what they can do. And the thing is that they're always curious. They're always interested yeah. in figuring out what they can do better. And I feel like maybe some of those CEOs should go and hang out in fifth grade and <laughs> see what the teachers are doing. No, no, I think it, well, you know, it, it, that brings up another topic, which is very different in a way. And that is, in a practical sense, some of the little things you can do. There was a little research piece that I read. And this was, you had the research base and so on. But the, the fundamental point was, Mr. Jones, we'll make him a, a mister because he's kind of a tough guy. Mr. Jones, the teacher of the eighth grade history class, when kids are coming into class, he always stands by the door and he always looks them in the eye and he's all, always got a smile on his face. Mm -hmm. Now, isn't that cool? The answer is yes, it's cool. And literally the disciplinary offenses that came out of his kids were reduced by 40% as a function of standing in the doorway, looking in you, you in the eye and smiling. It's it's engagement. It bottom line, it it is it is engaging with the people 
you're leading. And you, and you talk about that. You talk about extreme employee engagement and being obsessed with, as a leader, being obsessed with your people thriving. I, I would love to know if, is that the root of it? What is the root of, of your notion that leaders should be obsessed with engaging their people? Well, the root of the notion is the only reason I'm allowed to speak to you is that 43 years ago, no, that was later on after the research, 18 plus, 39 years ago, I wrote a book called In Search of Excellence, and a whole lot of people bought it, and it was off to the races. So that's the point. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this book called In Search of Excellence and said a lot of these things that I'm still saying, but, but here's the real point. In the research for that book, which lasted three or four years, there was, and I usually hate bullshit remarks like this, there was a defining moment, a breakthrough moment, an epiphany. And I was working in the San Francisco office of the now disgraced McKinsey and Company. Uh, and we were in San Francisco and 30 miles down the road uh, was a big, but not a huge company and not what they are today, which, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, and it was called Hewlett Packard. Mm. And so uh, my subsequent co-author of In Search of Excellence, Bob Waterman and I get in our cars in San Francisco and we drive down to Palo Alto and we have an interview with John Young, the president of the Hewlett Packard Corporation. First of all, we get to the front desk. Uh, well, no, it started a week earlier, for God's sakes. I, I'm making the appointment for the interview. And I've been working with, you know, Chase Manhattan Bank at Citicorp and all these big people that McKinsey works with. And I pick up my phone in San Francisco and I look up in the phone book. These are the days of phone books. The number for Hewlett Packard in Palo Alto. And I call the main number at the front desk. And we want an interview with uh, the president, John Young. And I say to the person at the front desk, I said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk to John Young. Now, having been through the city corps, et cetera, I know that I will be speaking to the executive assistant to his executive assistant, who eventually will get to him. So I'm just sitting there, you know, picking my teeth and his voice comes on the line. Is this John Young? Who's this? I thought, oh, shit. I'm on the phone with the president of Hewlett Packard. Then anyway, we go ahead six weeks, we get down to Hewlett Packard. And there was a magical moment. Uh, and it has to be translated into Zoom now, but let's just leave it alone as it was 39 years ago. John introduces us to what was called the HP way. And within that, he introduces us to M B. W A. And it was the turning point in my life. MBWA is managing by wandering around. Mm. Uh, and what it means is hanging out with the folks who are doing the work, sharing stories with them, asking that asking that frontliner, what sort of incredibly stupid thing have your two level of bosses done to you to make it harder for you to get your job done? And so he took he takes us out on a tour. Uh, First, young, this was a, one of the engineering spaces. It was young engineers. You know, these are 26 years old and he's probably 46 years old or something like that at the time. He knew all their names hmm. and they were not in the least bit intimidated about having a conversation with them. Then the part, this MBWA thing, there's, you know, we were somewhere or other and, you know, over in the corner was this old fart talking to a young engineer sitting in front of a computer screen. And John said, he said, trust me, this wasn't planned. He said, come on over. So Bob Wooderman and I, like good little puppy dogs, follow him over to this place where this old fart speaking to a young engineer. And John, you know, says, uh, Bill, I'd like you to meet Tom Peters and Bob Wooderman. Bill is the first name of a guy whose last name is Hewlett. Hmm. Uh, as in the Hewlett of Hewlett. <laughs> And he's sitting there at age, I don't know what the hell he was at the time, let's call it 55 or something, sitting with a 24-year-old or 26-year-old or 22-year-old or 28-year-old frontline engineer just chatting about the stuff that was involved in that engineer's project. And what it, what it did is 
I mean, there's my new book. What if I just told you extreme humanism? This is a big company. It wasn't the monster today, which has lost its touch. It was a, already, though, a billion dollar company. It is a mm-hmm. big deal. I think it already was in the Fortune 500. And yet it's entirely human. And they really understand that their success is going to come from, you know, 100 conversations that Bill Hewlett has from with a 26 year old. And then Bill goes to another meeting with senior people. And he says, I was just talking to Dick Smith who's a 26 year engineer, 26 year old engineer. And he says, we're totally full of shit. And you know what I decided? He's right on that project. And, and, you know, it, 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 honest to God, I hate words like epiphany. That was an epiphany. We saw that even in a big company, let alone a small one, that human beings could work with human beings. And we saw that big bosses were not required by law to stay in their office. And that big bosses were not required by law to ensure that you stood when you walked in and they stayed at their desk, et cetera. And I could go on about that forever. But anyway, that was a magic moment. And that's extreme humanism. It's just, you know, new title, as I said, new package, same ideas. It's it's fascinating to me that you, that it carries through. Like you said, it works. And you can call it an epiphany. You can say the proof is in the pudding, whatever that is. It seems like you believe that that notion has to come from within, that excellence is imminent. So if that's true, how does a leader, how do you bring it out? How do you decide? How do you make that choice that from now on, extreme humanism is going to be the order of the day, particularly if there might be leaders above you who are holding fast to a a different way of doing things? Well, two different answers. Uh, The first one is more important, but it doesn't answer your question as well. One of the things that I say in the book and I've implied before is hire for empathy and promote for empathy. Mm. Uh, You know, we quote this guy, uh, his last name is Miller. What's his first name? I don't remember and it doesn't really terribly matter. He's a biotech CEO. And this was an interview with me. This is an interview I read about. And he said to whoever the researcher was, he said, well, our secret to success is we only hire nice people. Mm -hmm. And he said, he said, and guess what? He said, I am in a biotech firm. There are degrees that are so sophisticated that even I can't pronounce their names. Hmm. But even in those cases, even in those cases, there are plenty of the people, plenty of people on earth who have that degree, hire the nice ones, forget the jerks. And in his case, so Mr. Miller, Dr. Miller, has this interview with you, and he just falls in love with your CV. And he can't believe how smart you are, and he can't believe how amazing you are and how much you would contribute. Well, your interview is over with the CEO, and you now, this is his term, not mine, I'll be it's not a new term, you have to run the gauntlet. Mm-hmm. And that means you have six or seven 10 minute interviews with real people. You may be in the company cafeteria, you may be with a junior finance person, you may be with a senior scientist, but you have a half a dozen interviews and every single one of those interviews is allowed to say, nope, we don't want her on our payroll. So, and that whole point is multiplied in a biggish firm or higher, larger, a hundred times when it comes to first line managers. Mm. First line managers, I say it in the book, I think I said it in maybe the past book or something, your complete collection of six or 10 or 106 first line managers is the number one asset in the organization. As somebody said with research evidence behind them, people don't leave companies they leave their boss. Mm. Uh, so, you know, well, and then I want to say one other thing, and then I want to say one other thing. Relative to your point about a place where all the bosses above you, sizable number of the bosses above you are not exactly the world's most charming human being uh, beings, 
my colleague Nancy Austin and I co-wrote my second book, which was called A Passion for Excellence. And I think it was Nancy. I don't think it was me. It doesn't matter anyway. We developed this term and we called it pockets of excellence. Mm. And it can be the most unhappy company on earth, but you've got your team of 11 trainers or you've got your little division of 23 people doing this. That can be sunshine in the middle of a hurricane. Mm. You can make your place incredibly good and maybe a little bit of it a rub off. But I, I am not going to be stupid enough to talk to you and say that if we're talking about a 100 person company and if the 17 bosses are people that you would never invite to dinner because they are unpleasant people, Tom, what do you do to change that? And the answer is quit and run as fast as you can. And I'm not being an idiot here because I realize we're still in a pandemic. And I realize that the primo thing that all of us have to do, and particularly people who weren't quite as lucky as me and maybe you, is you got to hold on to your job, which means if you're working for an asshole, sorry about that, dude, we'll try to deal with it in 2022. So I completely acknowledge that pandemic times are not normal times. Mm -hmm. And if you have to put up with shit, you have to put up with shit because you'd like to feed your children. No issue about that. But assuming we come out the other end of this, then I will say hire for emotional intelligence, promote for emotional intelligence. And I don't mean some EQ score, but I mean, you know, hire decent people, hire people who get along with other people. Hire, you know, the, 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 there's this guy who wrote Swim with the Sharks. I can't remember the rest of the title. Harvey McKay was his name as a management book. And I love this. He had a company called McKay Envelopes, and it was really a big deal. It was in Minneapolis. Of course, Minnesota people are much nicer than your people and my people, but we'll <laughs> leave that aside for a minute. Uh, so you are, you are being interviewed for a senior job. His, his last test was he took you to a Minnesota Twins baseball game. <laughs> and he just wanted to see how you would behave when you were around normal people. Uh, you know, which which you button line in the in the beer or popcorn line, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. When you know, when you had a box seat and somebody came along to dust the seats as they used to do, would you treat the person dusting the seat with at least as much respect as you taught the person? Oh, I, I'm sorry, I always have these damn stories. So last one, then I'll shut up. Um, I love the stories. Keep going. <laughs> Two, two great guys wrote a great book, and I can't remember their name, but the book was called Management, we're back to Minnesota, Management Lessons from the Mayo Clinic. Mm. And the Mayo Clinic, 100 years ago, Dr. Mayo turned them into a people-first organization, which is not typical of the average hospital in 2021. At any rate, here's the deal. We're doing the interview thing again. And you are absolutely one of the 10 most prominent, incredibly intelligent heart surgeons on earth. And you're interviewing for a job at Mayo. Well, and we're going to make it a face-to-face -face interview. What, no, I guess it wouldn't have to be face-to-face. -face. What you don't know is that I got an, a little scorecard, and maybe it's a piece of paper with a pencil, though people don't own paper or pencils anymore. Uh, and during our 45 minute interview, I am literally counting the number of times that you use the word I and the number of times that you use the word we. Hmm. And if the I's beat the we's, Dr. Genius, go sell your goods somewhere else. Hmm. And, you know, there's one woman who was a surgeon uh, who's quoted in the book. And she was talking about that. And she said, I worked at a good hospital before, but she said, I am 100 times more effective at the Mayo Hospital because we work, for, we work together to make the patient outcomes better. And, you know, she's a scientist and she used, I mean, she obviously doesn't mean it technically. She said, she didn't say 10 times better. She said, I am 100 times better in my performance as a result of a place where staff, you know, uh, work with each other and support each other. Some, some other two guys 
and I'm not sure they were from Minnesota, even though all good people are from Minnesota. <laughs> uh, a couple of other guys wrote a book that was the same thing, basically. And the book was titled Putting the Patient Second. And the logic, obviously, which is not PhD logic, is if you want to put the patient first, then you got to put the pa people who are serving the pr patient more first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absol I, absolutely. I, and it's it's wonderful to me to hear you talking about this because it is so, again, you've seen it. You've worked within all of these systems and you see what works. And this notion of putting the patient second, of really putting your team first, because if they believe that they're valued, they will then be amazing at what they do with, with the patients or with the clients yeah. or customers. I, I adore that. And, and there's one other thing that I would love to sort of talk with you about. Your leadership team must, number one, from the book, I think is phenomenal. You said, and we're recording this on International Women's Day, so I love that I'm about to talk about this, and hopefully you will uh, be able to also, uh, basically you say, make women 50% of your board, that women should be in positions of power and decision-making processes. So what are the benefits of doing that? What benefits do women bring to the table in all of these different types of companies and organizations that we've been talking about? Okay. Do you have an hour? <laughs> uh, uh, let me tell you a trivial story because I've been telling you trivial stories. So I've got this new book coming out. I'm not trying to remind people of that. I it, is, it is dedicated to 11 people. Oh. All of them are women. Mm. We have endorsements, as books often do, at the front. All the endorsements are by women. Mm -hmm. I figure if I really want to pitch this idea, I've got to, you know, I've got to walk the talk. Uh, and you know, somebody said, "Well, you're going to piss off a lot of men," and I said, "God, I hope so." <laughs> uh, uh, I'm going to answer your question in two ways. And it needs to be answered in two ways. We will start with the hard-nosed marketing and sales side. The simple reality is that women make the lion's lion share of purchasing decisions. Hmm. Women are responsible for 80 or 85 percent of consumer goods and services decisions, which includes family finance, uh, health care, and so on. And in the United States, as you said, it's an international audience, so it doesn't necessarily hold in the United States in 2020, because I don't know what the deal is in 2021, over 50 percent of professional purchasing officers are women, hmm. meaning that women are making the decision on where the family vacation is, and they are making the decision on the five-year, $250 million IT investment. Hmm. So women are responsible. You know, this is the marketing side, and this is how I used to, in my early days on this topic, beat the hell out of men. Uh, and, and so that's the that's the marketing side. And I want to add an asterisk to that a little in a few minutes, which is a, a slight digression. Then you have the other side. And the other side, and I know that some number of people who are listening, watching us are going to discount this. And I'm really, really sorry about that. There is an enormous amount of literature, hard-nosed, that says women on average are better leaders than men. Mm. Now, I want to use, because I don't want to get in trouble, and I've gotten in trouble in the past, I said on average, there are great male leaders and there are shitty women leaders. Mm. But if we're looking at that bell-shaped curve, and talking about all leaders, women perform better. Hmm. Uh, one study that was reported in the uh, Harvard Business Review 
said there are 16 leadership variables that were identified. Women with statistical significance outscored men on 12 of them. Hmm. And not only that, which was doubly cool, is they outscored them on all the ones that were the tough guy ones, like <laughs> getting the job done, and making money and all that stuff. So, you know, and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you the next hour where I give you examples like that which are hard-nosed research. So women are better leaders. Uh, the same kind of research says women are better negotiators. They do these really, you people do those re these really strange things, like listen to other people. Uh, and the <laughs> negotiation to you is not a win-loss NFL football game. It's an effort, at least, to make it as win-win as possible. Mm -hmm. Women are better leaders. Women are better negotiators. Women are better salespeople. And again, a significant part of it is the listening and paying attention to your fellow human beings. And then the one I love because I can stuff it up so hard in the mails is Women Are Better Investors. There is a wonderful book with the best title that any book has ever had in the world of business and maybe even including the Holy Bible. And it's a book written by a woman whose name is Lou Ann Lofton. And the title of the book, I hope you've never heard this because I, I'm going to get a belly laugh out of you. The title of the book is Warren Buffett Invests Like a Girl, colon, and Why You Should Too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh, isn't that great? And, and you know what? You know, here's, you know, fundamentally, here's the deal. It's four o'clock in the afternoon and the trading floor is going to stop in 15 minutes. And I'm a guy. And I'm going to change your gender for just a minute. And I'm sitting next to you, who's another guy at your computer terminal. And you did something earlier that was really lucky. And you made a ton of money. And I only got 10 minutes left. And I'll be goddamned if you're going to make more money than I did this Wednesday. So I do. And again, excuse the language, some incredibly high risk dumb shit thing, just in the hopes that I can nail you this Wednesday. Well, women tend to do these really strange things actually think before they act. <laughs> uh, and they tend not to be wild and woolly and crazy decision makers. And so, you know, it works, it works with the, you know, with the finance side too. So, and, and one thing I've really pushed on, you know, my credentials are pretty damn good. I went to the big women's pro-choice march in Washington a Julian years ago. I taught the first affirmative action course ever taught at Stanford University. Uh, but my pitch in this book and prior books and speeches is not social justice. If you appreciate women and feel that they've been somewhat oppressed from the standpoint of social justice, A, I agree with you, and B, God bless you. But let's just stick with the business practicalities. Better leaders, better salespersons, better negotiators, better investors, and they buy everything. You know, you can be the most curmudgeonly prejudiced human being in the world, and you cannot get away from the statistics I just mentioned. Uh, and so mm -hmm. I, I mean, I'm getting even harder nosed. I think there's no excuse in any industry for less than 50% women on the board and less than 50% women in the executive suite. And if you respond to me, which you won't, and say there are not enough qualified women around, I will say, A, it's bullshit, but B, one of the reasons there aren't women qualified by the job title thing is you wouldn't promote them early on. Mm. Uh, and, and, you know, but I, I just feel so strong. It's just because you're being stupid. And then I want to bring something else up, but I want to just leave it at that. And I've pushed on the women's issues since I know exactly when 1996 and the woman who was president of my training company, uh, who I thought was great. And she came up to me in my office in Palo Alto and she said, Tom, you are going to, I was her boss, you are going to a meeting in Boston two weeks from now and you do not have the option of saying no. And so I said, okay, Heather, I'll say <laughs> yes. And she said, this is a meeting called of significant women 
to sit down with you and teach you the degree to which you have not one effing clue about what's going on relative to gender stuff. And boy, was she right. And oh, what a group it was. There was a company you may never have heard of because I think it's gone out of business or been you know, merged a hundred times now called Domain Home Fashions. The founder, a woman by the name of Judy George was there. The woman who started Disney University was there. The woman who was the first female Indy 500 driver was there. These were extraordinary women. And for two hours, again, they excuse the language, they beat the shit out of me. And, you know, that was my flipping point. Again, I don't believe in epiphanies, but we'll call that epiphany number two. So uh, I'm just huge on, I hate to call it the women, I, I'm huge on this issue and I'm huge for the right reasons. I'm just taking that all in for a second. It's so wonderful to, to hear you talk about it so eloquently. So I, and I thank you for that. And, and I want to, if it's okay, to, to talk about courage for a second. And something that you said, uh, I love so much. You said, whoever tries the most stuff wins and the weirdest weirdos are the most innovative. And so, can you can you talk a little bit about this notion of trying the most stuff and having the courage to do it and how often women have that courage to try i would love to hear about that uh from you from your perspective on that as far as innovation is concerned because just like women make such great investors and good leaders i think women also have just as much room to grow in innovation what are your thoughts on that oh. Well, my thoughts are I'm not going to waste more of your time. Of course they do. <laughs> next, <laughs> next question. The next question. Uh, well, I have this more general thing, and, and it is that whoever tries the most stuff wins. Uh, big, giant disruptions, great strategies, et cetera, are of no interest whatsoever to me. I believe that small things are more important than big things. Mm -hmm. uh, and being an insaniac about trying small twists that add up to something big, that's the name of the game for me. Uh, I call it WTTMSW, which you basically use the word. Whoever tries the most stuff wins. There's an MIT professor by the name of Michael Schrag who wrote an entire book that had a wonderful title, and the title was Serious play mm. and he basically said you can't innovate unless you try an incredible amount of stuff and not play in the jerk around play but it's got to be a playful place where we get off on each other trying new things and so on i am not however in giving you that answer which i are passionately believe i am not going to make it easy relative to the women's part of it because as you know approximately 10 million times better than i do women are often silenced in that regard mm -hmm. uh, and i couldn't tell you a few minutes ago how we can turn jerks into saints and i cannot tell you a magic secret for how you get men to shut up and listen. Uh, I mean, the research is there. There's, I was just reading some recent research and it was during, let's say, meetings. Who interrupts the most, mm -hmm. women or men? Well, men are clear, women do, they're always talking. Well, the real reality is men do by about a, a factor of two to one, so, mm -hmm. you know, Get over that. Oh, God, I just wish dearly that I could say this exactly correctly. It was it was it was in a tweet and then I read the basic thing. I'm going to try to do this. Uh, a guy is talking to a woman who is either a customer or a potential customer. And he asks the question, and she responds, and four times in a row, 
he, the salesman, cuts her off hmm. in the middle of a response. Now he asks a fifth question. And she sits there. And she doesn't open her mouth. And at some point he said, well, aren't you going to answer? And she said, no, you're going to cut me off in the middle of the answer to the question. So why don't you just answer your own question? Oh, God, I love that. <laughs> that made my day, week, month, year, decade. <laughs> I love it. Can't you see it? Can't you visualize it? I just totally. love it. You know, I mean, honest to God, I want to promote her to president of the planet instantly. <laughs> uh, I do... I do want to say, as I said, this is on average, they're great men and they're awful women. There's no issue about that. Um, but, you know, from a neurological standpoint, you and I do have some differences. And it's not just you can make babies and I can't. Uh, I, there's a woman by the name of Luann Brizendine. She is a University of San Francisco University of California, San Francisco, neuro, neuropsychologist. Uh, and one thing that I love, and it's on this listening thing and on getting people together to help them grow. By age five days after popping out of the birth canal, by age five days, days girl babies are making three times more eye contact with those who they come around are around them than boys are and so this this proclivity this instinct to be more engaging of your fellow human beings you know it's been going on since your third day and so there's you know there's we can do it without the science there's a lot of nature involved and there's a lot of nurture involved but there really is a, a different a different sort of instinct i mean i and you know i don't know what i'm talking about here but i think i'm right i take it all back to darwin and natural selection what did guys do we ran around in the jungle and threw threw spears at animals what did women do they raised children they build a community uh, and, and it was a more human engaged exercise. I just read something and I can't tell you about the book because it's the most wonderful book in the world. And we don't have forever. Uh, and basically this doctor researcher male said that Darwin never said that survival of the fittest or doggy dog was the way to get ahead. What Darwin said was the people who had the strongest communities got ahead because they grew more babies and they grew more food and so on and so forth. So dog eat dog, you know, San Francisco 49ers versus the Dallas Cowboys is not the centerpiece of life. Hmm. Mm -hmm. it, it's a uh, wonderful example is said uh, by Harari in Sapiens about the, the Homo sapiens ability to excel. It lies directly in its in our ability to work as a community. It, and the research bears them out from time immemorial that we were able to work in community. And that is why our species has excelled. Yeah. And it's it's wonderful and it's fascinating. And yet I come back to this notion of imminence, that it's here right now, that every instant is an opportunity to strive for community, to listen to each other, to be, to quote Bill and Ted's excellent adventure, to be excellent to each other. So, so if excellence is the next five minutes, what does well, that mean? Well, I'm gonna do two things. One, I'm gonna back up for a minute. And then I'm going to try to answer your question. Okay. Uh, there was research that was done, and I read about it in a Washington Post article, and, and this is so powerful to me. Uh, Google, the home of the techies, techies, techies. And just listen to these two paragraphs. Google looked at its best employees, and it looked at its best teams. Project Oxygen data from founding in 1998 to 2013. 
shocked everyone by concluding that among the eight most important qualities of Google's top employees, STEM came dead last and the seven top characteristics were all the soft skills, being a good coach, communicating and listening, et cetera. So top employees, Google, the techiest of techies, top employees, seven out of eight characteristics are the soft stuff. Then they did the same thing called Project Aristotle for the best teams. In data, its data analysis revealed that the company's most important and productive ideas come from B teams, composed of employees that don't always have to be the smarter in the room, who focus on the soft skills, uh, equality, generosity, curiosity, et cetera. So, you know, even at Google, uh, I don't know whether Google's done anything about it. What was the first the real question you asked? But I just <laughs> love, I just love that. Yeah. Um, okay, ask your question again, and I well, promise. I'll no, 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 no. It's it's absolutely fine. You, you actually kind of did answer the question. This notion that we can be excellent to each other, sure, and oh. that it's imminent, that, that oh, yeah. excellence is what you do now, what you do, the, the small things right. you do right now, instead of necessarily the things that are five years from now. Well, let me, let me put it in the most practical terms known to humankind. Uh, I've been doing what I'm doing, focusing on, to some extent, the same stuff since the beginning of the research for In Search of Excellence, I've been doing it for 43 years. Uh, and I also got a whole bunch of degrees and all that stuff. And I really feel this, I hope you do too. My entire life is about the quality of your and my conversation. Mm -hmm. That is the only thing that I am doing as a human being during this hour of conversation. There is nothing else. I mean, you know, somebody called me and said someone who I loved had been hurt. Obviously, I would have run like hell at full speed. But in the practical sense of the word, there's nothing in my life except our conversation. And that, to me, is what it's all about. You know, they say being in the moment and so on. And I guess... You know, I guess that's the same kind of thing, but it's, you know, it's, it, 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 it's always, you know, I wrote this list of the little things that take five minutes and maybe it takes a little longer, but I said the definition, uh, you know, you're in Brooklyn and I'm in on the South coast of Massachusetts and the temperature was 25 this morning and, you know, it looks like a little snow is coming. I said, the definition of excellence is if you're downtown stopping at a flower stall on the way to work and buying a bunch of flowers on a cold, snowy, miserable day and bringing them to work and putting them in a vase. And incidentally, men are capable of doing this too. It's that's excellence. It's just a little, a little, little itsy bitsy, teeny weeny cheer me up. And, and I really think things like that can turn around the most, the biggest kinds of activities. Well, you got my vote. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I agree with you 150% because it, it feels to me like when we're in, when you have the opportunity, and the word I come back to always is kindness. When you have the opportunity to be kind, take it. You know, that to me is the, the most important thing. And yeah. I, I love that you said that that the focus that you have is on what you're doing. You know, if you are in, in conversation with me, if you are having lunch with your wife, if you're working at a 500, Fortune 500 company, the focus should be on what you're doing. And if it is, then that's where excellence is. I love, I love very much that you said that because I think we lose sight of that. I think we lose sight of it in the planning for tomorrow, next week, next month, next yeah. year. So if you could tell people who are natural planners rather than perhaps have who have those soft skills, the first step to beginning, what would that be? Well, 
Well, you answered the question. I don't have to answer. <laughs> be kind. And be kind means, well, here's what I said. And I actually had a psychiatrist friend who said he wouldn't buy my act, but he wouldn't not buy my act. <laughs> I said, you're a boss. I said, if you will hand me, I guess you'd put it on your screen, if you will provide me with the last 10, 10 line emails that you have sent, I can do a full psychiatric diagnosis of who you are as a human being. And my psychiatrist friend, this big deal psychiatrist, he said, I'm not willing to go the whole way with you on that, Tom. But he said, I'll go the first 98%. You know, and it's true of a, of a message. Do you, here, here's this little thing. Uh, there's somebody who helps my wife and I with our finances. And there was a problem and we shifted to a, another person who helps us. And this new person, I get emails from her with some degree of regularity. Uh, and this, to me, has nothing to do with gender. Maybe it does, but that's not the point. She sends me an email, and the email starts with, Hi, Tom, or Good morning, Tom, or Good afternoon, Tom. And then there's a comma, and then there's a space, and then she does the thing that has to be done technically in the conversation. And then after the last word of that part of it, you see have a good day, comma, space, Barbara. You know what? When she started doing that, the first thing I realized is that I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm doing it now. And, you know, she's busier than hell. And it's a business thing. And it's a transaction. And it may have to do with a screwed up American Express platinum card or something like that. But it's just, just taking an eighth of a minute or something like that to humanize it a little bit. And I don't think there's anything more dehumanized, even though we say it's for speedy, whatever, whatever, uh, than 90% of the messages that people send. Mm. Mm. You know, they, they just, they aren't pleasant. And you only need four or five additional words. But, you know, to me, that single message or 10 message says what I, who you are as a human being. You working on the resume virtues or you working on the eulogy virtues? Uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, it's, it's in the moment down to, I mean, I mean, tell, doesn't it doesn't make sense. I mean, it was really cool when I figured out that she said, hi, Tom, and then have a good afternoon. I thought, oh, first I went through my head. Holy shit. This is incredible. You know, and, and it, and it was just just this little teeny wee humanizing thing. And she does it by rote to some extent, of course, because she sent a million emails, but she still bothers to do it. And, and, and you know, because all my emails start with, you know, Shelly, we got a problem with X. And, okay. Uh, and <laughs> Shelly's a mom with two kids at home and a lot going on in life and everything else. And couldn't I just started a little bit with how are things going this afternoon and i try uh but you know that's the that's that's it as far as i'm concerned and i gotta run by the way it's um pretty quickly <laughs> i know we i could i could he keep you here for the next 16 hours yeah. uh i i agree with you completely and i i love that it shows caring that's ultimately what that is to me when when i hear you say that it shows that you care and caring is up up there with kindness so yeah i yeah absolutely i'm, I'm really grateful to you tom for for taking this time to chat with me on the show. And if I could ask you just one last question, and I think we probably have already said it, but it, it's really simple. It is, if you had an airplane that could skywrite anything for the whole world to see, what would you say? Well, you nailed it a couple minutes ago. There's a quote that I use in the book, and I think I used it in the last book, and I think it's from either Henry James or William James. And the quote is, there are three things in the world that are important. The first one is to be kind. 
The second one is to be kind. And the third one is to be kind. So that's what my skywriter is going to say. <laughs> I love it. I love it, Tom. Thank you again so much. And congratulations on the book, Excellence Now, Extreme Humanism. It comes out today because the episode comes out on the 15th. So go out there and get this book. You're going to love having it and you're going to learn a lot. And Tom, again, thank you. This is Isolde Trachtenberg for the Innovative Mindset Podcast, reminding you to listen, learn, laugh, and love a whole lot. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you being here. Please subscribe to the podcast if you're new. And if you like what you're hearing, please review it and rate it and let other people know. And if you'd like to be a sponsor of the show, I'd love to meet you on patreon.com slash innovative mindset. I also have lots of exclusive goodies to share just with the show's supporters there. Today's episode was produced by Zolda Trachtenberg and is copyright 2021. As always, please remember this is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Results, although we can always hope. Until next time, keep living in your innovative mindset. <laughs>